Criticism of Islam has existed since its formative stages. Early written disapproval came from Christians as well as by some former Muslims such as Ibn al-Rawandi. Western criticism has grown in the 21st century. Objects of criticism include the morality and authenticity of the Quran and the Hadiths, along with the life of Muhammad, both in his public and personal life. Other criticism concerns many aspects of human rights in the Islamic world in both historical and present-day societies, including the treatment of women, LGBT groups, and religious and ethnic minorities in Islamic law and practice. In the recent adoption of multiculturalism, some have questioned Islam's influence on the ability or willingness of Muslim citizens and immigrants to assimilate into Western countries. The issues when debating and questioning Islam are incredibly complex with each side having a different view on the morality, meaning, interpretation, and authenticity of each topic. History Early Islam The earliest surviving written criticisms of Islam are to be found in the writings of Christians who came under the early dominion of the Islamic Caliphate. One such Christian was John of Damascus c. 676-749 CE, who was familiar with Islam and Arabic. The second chapter of his book, The Fount of Wisdom, titled, Concerning Heresies, presents a series of discussions between Christians and Muslims. John claimed an Aryan monk whom he did not know was Bahira influenced Muhammad and viewed the Islamic doctrines as nothing more than a hodgepodge culled from the Bible. Other notable early critics of Islam included Abu Isa al Warak and Ibn al Rawandi, two 9th century critics of Islam and religion in general, along with al Mari, an 11th century Arab poet and critic of Islam and all other religions who was also known for his veganism and antinatalism. Medieval Islamic world In the early centuries of the Islamic Caliphate, including the period ruled by the four Rashidun Caliphs often called the rightly guided Caliphs, Islamic law permitted citizens to freely express their views, including criticism of Islam and religious authorities, without fear of persecution. As such, there have been several notable critics and skeptics of Islam that arose from within the Islamic world itself. In 10th and 11th century Syria there lived a blind poet called Al-Mari. He became well known for a poetry that was affected by a pervasive pessimism. He labeled religions in general as noxious weeds and said that Islam does not have a monopoly on truth. He had particular contempt for the ulema, writing that they recite their sacred books, although the fact informs me that these are fiction from first to last. O reason, thou alone speakest the truth. Then perish the fools who forged the religious traditions or interpreted them. In 1280, the Jewish philosopher, Ibn Kamuna, criticized Islam in his book Examination of the Three Faiths. He reasoned that the Sharia was incompatible with the principles of justice, and that this undercut the notion of Muhammad being the perfect man. There is no proof that Muhammad attained perfection and the ability to perfect others is claimed. The philosopher thus claimed that people converted to Islam from ulterior motives. That is why, to this day we never see anyone converting to Islam unless in terror, or in quest of power, or to avoid heavy taxation, or to escape humiliation, or if taken prisoner, or because of infatuation with a Muslim woman, or for some similar reason. Nor do we see a respected, wealthy, and pious non-Muslim well versed in both his faith and that of Islam, going over to the Islamic faith without some of the aforementioned or similar motives. According to Bernard Lewis, just as it is natural for a Muslim to assume that the converts to his religion are attracted by its truth, it is equally natural for the converts' former coreligionists to look for baser motives and Ibn Kamuna's list seems to cover most of such nonreligious motives. Maimonides, one of the foremost 12th-century rabbinical arbiters and philosophers, sees the relation of Islam to Judaism as primarily theoretical. Maimonides has no quarrel with the strict monotheism of Islam, but finds fault with the practical politics of Muslim governments. He also considered Islamic ethics and politics to be inferior to their Jewish counterparts. Maimonides criticized what he perceived as the lack of virtue in the way Muslims rule their societies and relate to one another. In his epistle to Yemenite Jewry, he refers to Muhammad, as Hamashuga, that madman. Enlightenment Europe 
In Of the Standard of Taste, an essay by David Hume, the Quran is described as an absurd performance of a pretended prophet who lacked a just sentiment of morals. Attending to the narration, Hume says, We shall soon find that Muhammad bestows praise on such instances of treachery, inhumanity, cruelty, revenge, bigotry, as are utterly incompatible with civilized society. No steady rule of right seems there to be attended to, and every action is blamed or praised, so far as it is beneficial or hurtful to the true believers. 19th and 20th century During the 19th and 20th centuries, numerous personalities criticized Muslims and Islam. The Hindu philosopher Vivekananda commented on Islam, now, some Mohammedans are the crudest in this respect, and the most sectarian. Their watch word is, There is one God, and Muhammad is his prophet. Everything beyond that not only is bad, but must be destroyed forthwith. At a moment's notice, every man or woman who does not exactly believe in that must be killed, everything that does not belong to this worship must be immediately broken, every book that teaches anything else must be burned. From the Pacific to the Atlantic, for 500 years blood ran all over the world. That is Mohammedanism. Nevertheless, among these Mohammedans, wherever there has a philosophic man, he was sure to protest against these cruelties. In that he showed the touch of the divine and realized a fragment of the truth, he was not playing with his religion, for it was not his father's religion he was talking, but spoke the truth direct like a man. The more selfish a man, the more immoral he is. And so also with the race. That race which is bound down to itself has been the most cruel and the most wicked in the whole world. There has not been a religion that has clung to this dualism more than that founded by the Prophet of Arabia, and there has not been a religion, which has shed so much blood and been so cruel to other men. In the Quran there is the doctrine that a man who does not believe these teachings should be killed, it is a mercy to kill him. And the surest way to get to heaven, where there are beautiful huris and all sorts of sense enjoyments, is by killing these unbelievers. Think of the bloodshed there has been in consequence of such beliefs. Why religions should claim that they are not bound to abide by the standpoint of reason, no one knows. If one does not take the standard of reason, there cannot be any true judgment, even in the case of religions. One religion may ordain something very hideous. For instance, the Mohammedan religion allows Mohammedans to kill all who are not of their religion. It is clearly stated in the Quran, kill the infidels if they do not become Mohammedans. They must be put to fire and sword. Now if we tell a Mohammedan that this is wrong, he will naturally ask, How do you know that? How do you know it is not good? My book says it is. Dayanand Saraswati calls the concept of Islam to be highly offensive, and doubted that there is any connection of Islam with God. Had the God of the Quran been the Lord of all creatures, and been merciful and kind to all, he would never have commanded the Mohammedans to slaughter men of other faiths, and animals, etc. If he is merciful, will he show mercy even to the sinners? If the answer be given in the affirmative, it cannot be true, because further on it is said in the Quran, put infidels to sword. In other words, he that does not believe in the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad is an infidel, he should, therefore, be put to death, since the Quran sanctions such cruelty to non-Muhammadans and innocent creatures such as cows, it can never be the word of God. Pandit Lekh Ram regarded that Islam was grown through the violence and desire for wealth. He further asserted that Muslims deny the entire Islamic prescribed violence and atrocities, and will continue doing so. He wrote, All educated people start looking down upon the forcible conversions and even started objecting to their very basis. Since then some naturalist Mohammadis Muslims are trying, rather opposing falsehood and accepting the truth, to prove unnecessarily and wrongly that Islam never indulged in jihad and the people were never converted to Islam forcibly. Neither any temples were demolished nor were ever cows slaughtered in the temples. Women and children belonging to other religious sects were never forcibly converted to Islam nor did they ever commit any sexual acts with them as could have been done with the slave males and females both. The Victorian Orientalist scholar Sir William Muir criticized Islam for what he perceived to be an inflexible nature, which he held responsible for stifling progress and impeding social advancement in Muslims' countries. The following sentences are taken from the Reed Lecture he delivered at Cambridge in 1881. Some, indeed, dream of an Islam in the future, rationalized and regenerate. 
All this has been tried already, and has miserably failed. The Quran has so encrusted the religion in a hard unyielding casement of ordinances and social laws, that if the shell be broken the life is gone. A rationalistic Islam would be Islam no longer. The contrast between our own faith and Islam is most remarkable. There are in our scriptures living germs of truth, which accord with civil and religious liberty, and will expand with advancing civilization. In Islam it is just the reverse. The Quran has no such teaching as with us has abolished polygamy, slavery, and arbitrary divorce, and has elevated woman to her proper place. As a reformer, Muhammad did advance his people to a certain point, but as a prophet he left them fixed immovably at that point for all time to come. The tree is of artificial planting. Instead of containing within itself the germ of growth and adaptation to the various requirements of time and clime and circumstance, expanding with the genial sunshine and rain from heaven, it remains the same forced and stunted thing as when first planted some twelve centuries ago. Winston Churchill criticized what he alleged to be the effects Islam had on its believers, which he described as fanatical frenzy combined with fatalistic apathy, enslavement of women, and militant proselytizing. In his 1899 book The River War he says, How dreadful are the curses which Mohammedanism lays on its votaries. Besides the fanatical frenzy, which is as dangerous in a man as hydrophobia in a dog, there is this fearful fatalistic apathy. The effects are apparent in many countries. Improvident habits, slovenly systems of agriculture, sluggish methods of commerce, and insecurity of property exist wherever the followers of the Prophet rule or live. A degraded sensualism deprives this life of its grace and refinement, the next of its dignity and sanctity. The fact that in Mohammedan law every woman must belong to some man as his absolute property, either as a child, a wife, or a concubine, must delay the final extinction of slavery until the faith of Islam has ceased to be a great power among men. Thousands become the brave and loyal soldiers of the faith, all know how to die but the influence of the religion paralyzes the social development of those who follow it. No stronger retrograde force exists in the world. Far from being moribund, Mohammedanism is a militant and proselytizing faith. It has already spread throughout Central Africa, raising fearless warriors at every step, and were it not that Christianity is sheltered in the strong arms of science, the science against which it had vainly struggled, the civilization of modern Europe might fall, as fell the civilization of ancient Rome. According to historian Warren Doctor, Churchill wrote this during a time of a fundamentalist revolt in Sudan and this statement does not reflect his full view of Islam, which were "...often paradoxical and complex." He could be critical but at times "...romanticized." The Islamic world, he exhibited great "...respect, understanding and magnanimity." Churchill had a fascination of Islam and Islamic civilization. Winston Churchill's future sister-in-law expressed concerns about his fascination by stating, P. Lease don't become converted to Islam, I have noticed in your disposition a tendency to Orientalism. According to historian Warren Doctor, however, he never seriously considered converting. He primarily admired its martial aspects, the Ottoman Empire's history of territorial expansion and military acumen to the extent that in 1897 he wished to fight for the Ottoman Empire. According to Doctor, this was largely for his lust for glory. Based on Churchill's letters, he seemed to regard Islam and Christianity as equals. James Fitzjames Stephen, describing what he understood to be the Islamic conception of the ideal society, wrote the following, Not only are the varieties of morality innumerable, but some of them are conflicting with each other. If a Mohammedan, for instance, is fully to realize his ideal, to carry out into actual fact his experiment of living, he must be one of a ruling race which has trodden the enemies of Islam under their feet, and has forced them to choose between the tribute and the sword. He must be able to put in force the law of the Quran both as to the faithful and as to unbelievers. In short, he must conquer. Englishmen come into a country where Mohammedans had more or less realized their ideal, and proceed to govern it with the most unfeigned belief in the order of ideas of which liberty is the motto. Zoroastrian writer Sadej Hedayat regarded Islam as the corrupter of Iran, he said, Every aspect of life and thought, including women's condition, changed after Islam. Enslaved by men, women were confined to the home. Polygamy, injection of fatalistic attitude, mourning, sorrow and grief led people to seek solace in magic, witchcraft, prayer, and supernatural beings. 
The church historian Philip Schaff described Islam as spread by violence and fanaticism, and producing a variety of social ills in the regions it conquered. Muhammadanism conquered the fairest portions of the earth by the sword and cursed them by polygamy, slavery, despotism, and desolation. The moving power of Christian missions was love to God and man, the moving power of Islam was fanaticism and brute force. Schaff also described Islam as a derivative religion based on an amalgamation of heathenism, Judaism and Christianity. Islam is not a new religion. I.T. is a compound or mosaic of pre-existing elements, a rude attempt to combine heathenism, Judaism and Christianity, which Muhammad found in Arabia, but in a very imperfect form. J. M. Neal criticized Islam in terms similar to those of Shaf, arguing that it was made up of a mixture of beliefs that provided something for everyone. Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 he Muhammad also infuses into his religion so much of each of those tenets to which the varying sects of his countrymen were addicted, as to enable each and all to please themselves by the belief that the new doctrine was only a reform of, an improvement on, that to which they had been accustomed. The Christians were conciliated by the acknowledgement of our Lord as the greatest of prophets, the Jews, by the respectful mention of Moses and their other lawgivers, the idolaters, by the veneration which the impostor professed for the Temple of Mecca, and the black stone which it contained, and the Chaldeans, by the pre-eminence which he gives to the ministrations of the angel Gabriel, and his whole scheme of the seven heavens. To a people devoted to the gratification of their passions and addicted to oriental luxury, he appealed, not unsuccessfully, by the promise of a paradise whose sensual delights were unbounded, and the permission of a free exercise of pleasures in this world. Mahatma Gandhi, the moral leader of the 20th century Indian independence movement, found the history of Muslims to be aggressive, while he pointed out that Hindus have passed that stage of societal evolution. Though, in my opinion, non-violence has a predominant place in the Quran, the 1300 years of imperialistic expansion has made the Muslims fighters as a body. They are therefore aggressive. Bullying is the natural excrescence of an aggressive spirit. The Hindu has an ages-old civilization. He is essentially non-violent. His civilization has passed through the experiences that the two recent ones are still passing through. If Hinduism was ever imperialistic in the modern sense of the term, it has outlived its imperialism and has either deliberately or as a matter of course given it up. Predominance of the non-violent spirit has restricted the use of arms to a small minority which must always be subordinate to a civil power highly spiritual, learned and selfless. The Hindus as a body are therefore not equipped for fighting. But not having retained their spiritual training, they have forgotten the use of an effective substitute for arms and not knowing their use nor having an aptitude for them, they have become docile to the point of timidity and cowardice. This vice is therefore a natural excrescence of gentleness. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister of India, in his book Discovery of India, describes Islam to have been a faith for military conquests. He wrote, Islam had become a more rigid faith suited more to military conquests rather than the conquests of the mind, and that Muslims brought nothing new to his country. The Muslims who came to India from outside brought no new technique or political or economic structure. In spite of religious belief in the Brotherhood of Islam, they were class-bound and feudal in outlook. Topic. Modern world. André Servier, a historian who lived in French Algeria at the beginning of the 20th century, studied the customs and manners of the North African people. He became one of the few French intellectuals to study the Sira of Ibn Ishaq in depth, and his research included the Ottoman Empire and the Pan-Islamic movement. He criticized Islam in his book L'Islam et la psychologie du musulman. Servier argued that, Islam is Christianity adapted to Arab mentality, and that it is incapable of adapting itself to civilization." Similarly, he argued that Islamic law is only the Roman code revised and corrected by Arabs. Islamic science, nothing but Greek science interpreted by the Arab brain, and Islamic architecture, a distorted imitation of the Byzantine style. Servier described Islam as a doctrine of death, and concluded that it had broken the impulse towards progress and checked the evolution of society in the Muslim world. As Servier put it, To sum up, the Arab has borrowed everything from other nations, literature, art, science, and even his religious ideas. 
He has passed it all through the sieve of his own narrow mind, and being incapable of rising to high philosophic conceptions, he has distorted, mutilated and desiccated everything. This destructive influence explains the decadence of Muslim nations and their powerlessness to break away from barbarism. Topic. Modern Christianity The early 20th century missionary James L. Barton argued that Islam's view of the sovereignty of God is so extreme and unbalanced as to produce a fatalism that stifles human initiative. Man is reduced to a cipher. Human agency and human freedom are nullified. Right is no longer right because it is right, but because Allah wills it to be right. It is for this reason that monotheism has in Islam stifled human effort and progress. It has become a deadening doctrine of fate. Man must believe and pray, but these do not ensure salvation or any benefit except Allah wills it. Why should human effort strive by sanitary means to prevent disease, when death or life depends in no way on such measures but upon the will of Allah? One reason why Muslim countries are so stagnant and backward in all that goes to make up a high civilization is owing to the deadening effects of monotheism thus interpreted. Even in the most extreme forms of the Augustinian and Calvinistic systems there were always present in Christianity other elements which prevented the conception of the divine sovereignty from paralyzing the healthy activities of life as the Mohammedan doctrine has done. G. K. Chesterton criticized Islam as a derivative from Christianity. He described it as a heresy or parody of Christianity. In The Everlasting Man he says, Islam was a product of Christianity, even if it was a byproduct, even if it was a bad product. It was a heresy or parody emulating and therefore imitating the Church. Islam, historically speaking, is the greatest of the Eastern heresies. It owed something to the quite isolated and unique individuality of Israel, but it owed more to Byzantium and the theological enthusiasm of Christendom. It owed something even to the Crusades. During a lecture given at the University of Regensburg in 2006, Pope Benedict XVI quoted an unfavorable remark about Islam made at the end of the 14th century by Manuel II Palaiologos, the Byzantine emperor. Show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. As the English translation of the Pope's lecture was disseminated across the world, many Muslim politicians and religious leaders protested against what they saw as an insulting mischaracterization of Islam. Mass street protests were mounted in many Muslim majority countries. The Majlis e Shura Pakistani Parliament unanimously called on the Pope to retract this objectionable statement. Topic: <laughs> Others. Nobel Prize-winning novelist V.S. Naipaul stated that Islam requires its adherents to destroy everything which is not related to it. He described it as having a calamitous effect on converted peoples. To be converted you have to destroy your past, destroy your history. You have to stamp on it, you have to say, my ancestral culture does not exist, it doesn't matter. Nobel Prize-winning playwright Wole Shoyinka stated that Islam had a role in denigrating African spiritual traditions. He criticized attempts to whitewash what he sees as the destructive and coercive history of Islam on the continent. Let those who wish to retain or evaluate religion as a 21st project feel free to do so, but let it not be done as a continuation of the game of denigration against the African spiritual heritage as in a recent television series perpetrated by Islam's born-again revisionist of history, Professor Ali Masrui. Shoyinka also regarded Islam as superstition and said that it does not belong to Africa. He stated that it is mainly spread with violence and force. Topic. Truthfulness of Islam and Islamic scriptures Topic. Reliability of the Quran Originality of Quranic manuscripts According to traditional Islamic scholarship, all of the Quran was written down by Muhammad's companions while he was alive during 610 to 632 CE, but it was primarily an orally related document. The written compilation of the whole Quran in its definite form as we have it now was completed around 20 years after the death of Muhammad. 
John Wansbrough, Patricia Crone and Yehuda D. Nevo argue that all the primary sources which exist are from 150 to 300 years after the events which they describe, and thus are chronologically far removed from those events, imperfections in the Quran. Critics reject the idea that the Quran is miraculously perfect and impossible to imitate as asserted in the Quran itself. The 1901-1906 Jewish Encyclopedia, for example, writes. The language of the Quran is held by the Muhammadans to be a peerless model of perfection. Critics, however, argue that peculiarities can be found in the text. For example, critics note that a sentence in which something is said concerning Allah is sometimes followed immediately by another in which Allah is the speaker. Examples of this are Surahs XVI 81, XXVII 61, XXXI. 9, and XLIII, 10. Many peculiarities in the positions of words are due to the necessities of rhyme LXIX, 31, LXXIV. 3. While the use of many rare words and new forms may be traced to the same cause, comp, especially XIX. 8, 9, 11, 16. More serious are factual inaccuracies. For instance, Surah 25.53 claims that fresh water and salt water do not mix. While there may be cases in which these two bodies of water mix only slowly, every fresh water river that reaches an ocean will mix with salt water. Such areas of mixing are called estuaries e.g. at the mouth of the Rio de la Plata. Judaism and the Quran. According to the Jewish Encyclopedia. The dependence of Muhammad upon his Jewish teachers or upon what he heard of the Jewish Haggadah and Jewish practices is now generally conceded." John Wansbrough believes that the Quran is a redaction in part of other sacred scriptures, in particular the Judeo-Christian scriptures. Herbert Berg writes that Despite John Wansbrough's very cautious and careful inclusion of qualifications such as conjectural and tentative and emphatically provisional his work is condemned by some. Some of this negative reaction is undoubtedly due to its radicalness. Wansbrough's work has been embraced wholeheartedly by few and has been employed in a piecemeal fashion by many. Many praise his insights and methods, if not all of his conclusions. Early jurists and theologians of Islam mention some Jewish influence but they also say where it is seen and recognized as such, it is perceived as a debasement or a dilution of the authentic message. Bernard Lewis describes this as, "...something like what in Christian history was called a Judaizing heresy." According to Moshe Sharon, the story of Muhammad having Jewish teachers is a legend developed in the 10th century CE. Philip Schaff described the Quran as having, Many passages of poetic beauty, religious fervor, and wise counsel, but mixed with absurdities, bombast, unmeaning images, low sensuality. Muhammad and God as speakers. According to Ibn Warak, the Persian rationalist, Ali Dashti criticized the Quran on the basis that for some passages, the speaker cannot have been God. Warak gives Surah al Fatiha as an example of a passage which is clearly addressed to God, in the form of a prayer. He says that by only adding the word, say, in front of the passage, this difficulty could have been removed. Furthermore, it is also known that one of the companions of Muhammad, Ibn Masud, rejected Surah Fatiha as being part of the Quran. These kind of disagreements are, in fact, common among the companions of Muhammad who could not decide which surahs were part of the Quran and which not. Other criticism The Quran contains verses which are difficult to understand or are perceived contradictory. There is a story that Shaitan Satan tricked Muhammad into praising the idols of the Quraysh known as the Satanic Verses. However the account is incredibly weak and there is no Sahih source which suggests this claim to be true. Some accounts of the history of Islam say there were two verses of the Quran that were allegedly added by Muhammad when he was tricked by Satan in an incident known as the story of the cranes, later referred to as the Satanic Verses. These verses were then retracted at Angel Gabriel's behest. The author of the Apology of Al-Kindi Abd al-Masi ibn Ishaq al-Kindi not to be confused with the famed philosopher al-Kindi claimed that the narratives in the Quran were all jumbled together and intermingled, and that this was an evidence that many different hands have been at work therein, and caused discrepancies, adding or cutting out whatever they liked or disliked.
The companions of Muhammad could not agree on which surahs were part of the Quran and which not. Two of the most famous companions being Ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Qab. Topic. Reliability of the Hadith Hadith are Muslim traditions relating to the Sunnah words and deeds of Muhammad. They are drawn from the writings of scholars writing between 844 and 874 CE, more than 200 years after the death of Muhammad in 632 CE. Within Islam, different schools, branches and sects have different opinions on the proper selection and use of hadith. The four schools of Sunni Islam all consider hadith second only to the Quran, although they differ on how much freedom of interpretation should be allowed to legal scholars. Shi'i scholars disagree with Sunni scholars as to which hadith should be considered reliable. The Shias accept the Sunnah of Ali and the Imams as authoritative in addition to the Sunnah of Muhammad, and as a consequence they maintain their own, different, collections of hadith. It has been suggested that there exists around the hadith three major sources of corruption political conflicts, sectarian prejudice, and the desire to translate the underlying meaning, rather than the original words verbatim. Muslim critics of the hadith, Quranists, reject the authority of hadith on theological grounds, pointing to verses in the Quran itself. Nothing have we omitted from the book declaring that all necessary instruction can be found within the Quran, without reference to the Hadith. They claim that following the Hadith has led to people straying from the original purpose of God's revelation to Muhammad, adherence to the Quran alone. Ghulam Ahmed Pervez was a noted critic of the Hadith and believed that the Quran alone was all that was necessary to discern God's will and our obligations. A fatwa, ruling, signed by more than a thousand orthodox clerics, denounced him as a kafir, a non-believer. His seminal work, Maqam e Hadith argued that the Hadith were composed of the garbled words of previous centuries, but suggests that he is not against the idea of collected sayings of the Prophet, only that he would consider any Hadith that goes against the teachings of Quran to have been falsely attributed to the Prophet. The 1986 Malaysian book, Hadith, a Re-Evaluation by Qasim Ahmad was met with controversy and some scholars declared him an apostate from Islam for suggesting that quote, quote, the hadith are sectarian, anti-science, anti-reason and anti-women. John Esposito notes that modern Western scholarship has seriously questioned the historicity and authenticity of the hadith, maintaining that the bulk of traditions attributed to the Prophet Muhammad were actually written much later. Quote, he mentions Joseph Schacht, considered the father of the revisionist movement, as one scholar who argues this, claiming that Schacht found no evidence of legal traditions before 722, from which Schacht concluded that the Sunnah of the Prophet is not the words and deeds of the Prophet, but apocryphal material, dating from later. Other scholars, however, such as Wilford Madeling, have argued that Wholesale rejection as late fiction is unjustified. Orthodox Muslims do not deny the existence of false hadith, but believe that through the scholar's work, these false hadith have been largely eliminated. Topic: <laughs> Lack of secondary evidence. The traditional view of Islam has also been criticized for the lack of supporting evidence consistent with that view, such as the lack of archaeological evidence, and discrepancies with non-Muslim literary sources. In the 1970s, what has been described as a wave of skeptical scholars challenged a great deal of the received wisdom in Islamic studies. They argued that the Islamic historical tradition had been greatly corrupted in transmission. They tried to correct or reconstruct the early history of Islam from other, presumably more reliable, sources such as coins, inscriptions, and non-Islamic sources. The oldest of this group was John Wansbrough 1928-2002. Wansbrough's works were widely noted, but perhaps not widely read. In 1972 a cache of ancient Qurans in a mosque in Sana'a, Yemen was discovered, commonly known as the Sana'a Manuscripts. The German scholar Gerd R. Puen has been investigating these Quran fragments for years. His research team made 35,000 microfilm photographs of the manuscripts, which he dated to early part of the 8th century. Puen has not published the entirety of his work, but noted unconventional verse orderings, minor textual variations, and rare styles of orthography. He also suggested that some of the parchments were palimpsests which had been reused. Puin believed that this implied an evolving text as opposed to a fixed one. Topic. 
Morality Muhammad Muhammad is considered as one of the prophets in Islam and as a model for followers. Critics such as Sigismund Cole and former Muslim Ibn Warak see some of Muhammad's actions as immoral. Qab ibn al Ashraf wrote a poetic eulogy commemorating the slain Quraysh notables. Later, he had traveled to Mecca and provoked the Quraysh to fight Muhammad. He also wrote erotic poetry about Muslim women, which offended the Muslims there. This poetry influenced so many that this too was considered directly against the constitution of Medina which states, Loyalty gives protection against treachery and this document will not be employed to protect one who is unjust or commits a crime. Other sources also state that he was plotting to assassinate Muhammad. Muhammad called upon his followers to kill Qab. Muhammad ibn Maslama offered his services, collecting four others. By pretending to have turned against Muhammad, Muhammad ibn Maslama and the others enticed Qab out of his fortress on a moonlit night, and killed him in spite of his vigorous resistance. The Jews were terrified at his assassination, and as the historian Ibn Ishaq put it, There was not a Jew who did not fear for his life. <laughs> Age of Muhammad's wife Aisha According to scriptural Sunnis hadith sources, Aisha was six or seven years old when she was married to Muhammad and nine when the marriage was consummated. However Shia Muslims tend to differ as to the age of Aisha. Muhammad ibn Jarir al-Tabari, born in Persia 200 years after Muhammad's death, suggested that she was ten years old. 600 years after Muhammad, ibn Kalakan recorded that she was nine years old at marriage, and twelve at consummation. Ibn Sa'd al-Baghdadi, born about 150 years after Muhammad's death, cited Hisham ibn Urwa as saying that she was nine years old at marriage, and twelve at consummation, but Hisham ibn Urwa's original source is otherwise unknown, and Ibn Sa'd al-Baghdadi's work does not have the high religious status of the hadith. In the 20th century, Indian writer Muhammad Ali challenged the hadith showing that Aisha was as young as the traditional sources claim, arguing that instead a new interpretation of the hadith compiled by Mishkat al-Masabi, Wali ud din Muhammad ibn Abdullah al-Khatib, could indicate that Aisha would have been 19 years old around the time of her marriage. Colin Turner, a UK professor of Islamic studies, states that since such marriages between an older man and a young girl were customary among the Bedouin, Muhammad's marriage would not have been considered proper by his contemporaries. Karen Armstrong, the British author on comparative religion, has affirmed that, "...there was no impropriety in Muhammad's marriage to Aisha. Marriages conducted in absentia to seal an alliance were often contracted at this time between adults and minors who were even younger than Aisha." <laughs> Morality of the Quran According to some critics, the morality of the Quran appears to be a moral regression when judged by the standards of the moral traditions of Judaism and Christianity it says that it builds upon. The Catholic Encyclopedia, for example, states that, "...the ethics of Islam are far inferior to those of Judaism and even more inferior to those of the New Testament," and "...that in the ethics of Islam there is a great deal to admire and to approve, is beyond dispute, but of originality or superiority, there is none." Critics stated that the Quran, Quran allows Muslim men to discipline their wives by striking them. There is however confusion amongst translations of Quran with the original Arabic term, wadrabahana, being translated as, to go away from them, beat, strike lightly, and Separate. The film Submission, which rose to fame after the murder of its director Theo van Gogh, critiqued this and similar verses of the Quran by displaying them painted on the bodies of abused Muslim women. Ayan Hirsi Ali, the film's writer, said, It is written in the Quran a woman may be slapped if she is disobedient. This is one of the evils I wish to point out in the film. Some critics argue that the Quran is incompatible with other religious scriptures as it attacks and advocates hate against people of other religions. For instance, Sam Harris interprets certain verses of the Quran as sanctioning military action against unbelievers as a whole both during the lifetime of Muhammad and after. The Quran said, 
Fight those who do not believe in Allah or in the last day and who do not consider unlawful what Allah and his messenger have made unlawful and who do not adopt the religion of truth from those who were given the scripture fight until they give the jizya willingly while they are humbled. Surah 929 in the end of Faith Harris argues that Muslim extremism is simply a consequence of taking the Quran literally, and is skeptical that moderate Islam is possible. Various calls to arms were identified in the Quran by U.S. citizen Muhammad Reza Tahari Azhar, all of which were cited as, "...most relevant to my actions on March 3, 2006." 944, 919, 57-10-11, 8-72-73, 9-120, 3-142, 3-146, 4-66, 4-104, 9-81, 9-93-94, 9-100, 16-110, 61-11-12, 47-35. Max I. Daman interprets that the Huris described in the Quran are specifically dedicated to male pleasure. Henry Martin claims that the concept of the Huris was chosen to satisfy Muhammad's followers. <inaudible> <inaudible> Slavery Bernard Lewis writes in one of the sad paradoxes of human history, it was the humanitarian reforms brought by Islam that resulted in a vast development of the slave trade inside, and still more outside, the Islamic empire." He notes that the Islamic injunctions against the enslavement of Muslims led to massive importation of slaves from the outside. According to Patrick Manning, Islam by recognizing and codifying the slavery seems to have done more to protect and expand slavery than the reverse, unlike Western societies which in their opposition to slavery spawned anti-slavery movements whose numbers and enthusiasm often grew out of church groups, no such grassroots organizations ever developed in Muslim societies. In Muslim politics the state unquestioningly accepted the teachings of Islam and applied them as law. Islam, by sanctioning slavery, also extended legitimacy to the traffic in slaves. It was only in the early 20th century post -World War I that slavery gradually became outlawed and suppressed in Muslim lands, largely due to pressure exerted by Western nations such as Britain and France. Gordon describes the lack of homegrown Islamic abolition movements as owing much to the fact that it was deeply anchored in Islamic law. By legitimizing slavery and, by extension, traffic in slaves, Islam elevated those practices to an unassailable moral plane. As a result, in no part of the Muslim world was an ideological challenge ever mounted against slavery. The political and social system in Muslim society would have taken a dim view of such a challenge. The issue of slavery in the Islamic world in modern times is controversial. Critics argue there is hard evidence of its existence and destructive effects. Others maintain slavery in central Islamic lands has been virtually extinct since mid-20th century, and that reports from Sudan and Somalia showing practice of slavery is in border areas as a result of continuing war and not Islamic belief. In recent years, according to some scholars, there has been a worrying trend of reopening of the issue of slavery by some conservative Salafi Islamic scholars after its closing. Earlier in the 20th century when Muslim-majority countries banned slavery and most Muslim scholars found the practice inconsistent with Quranic morality. Sheikh Fadlallah Hari of Karbala expressed the view in 1993 that the enforcement of servitude can occur but is restricted to war captives and those born of slaves. In a 2014 issue of their digital magazine Dabak, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant explicitly claimed religious justification for enslaving Yazidi women. Topic. Apostasy According to Islamic law apostasy is identified by a list of actions such as conversion to another religion, denying the existence of God, rejecting the prophets, mocking God or the prophets, idol worship, rejecting the sharia, or permitting behavior that is forbidden by the sharia, such as adultery or the eating of forbidden foods or drinking of alcoholic beverages. The majority of Muslim scholars hold to the traditional view that apostasy is punishable by death or imprisonment until repentance, at least for adult men of sound mind. Laws prohibiting religious conversion run contrary to Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which states that, 
e very one has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion, this right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom, either alone or in community with others and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance." The English historian C. E. Bosworth suggests the traditional view of apostasy hampered the development of Islamic learning, arguing that while the organizational form of the Christian university allowed them to develop and flourish into the modern university, the Muslim ones remained constricted by the doctrine of waqf alone, with their physical plant often deteriorating hopelessly and their curricula narrowed by the exclusion of the non-traditional religious sciences like philosophy and natural science. Out of fear that these could evolve into potential toe holds for KUFR, those people who reject God, in 13 Muslim majority countries atheism is punishable by death. Topic: <laughs> Islamic law. Bernard Lewis summarizes: The penalty for apostasy in Islamic law is death. Islam is conceived as a polity, not just as a religious community. It follows therefore that apostasy is treason. It is a withdrawal, a denial of allegiance as well as of religious belief and loyalty. Any sustained and principled opposition to the existing regime or order almost inevitably involves such a withdrawal. The four Sunni schools of Islamic jurisprudence, as well as Shia scholars, agree on the difference of punishment between male and female. A sane adult male apostate may be executed. A female apostate may be put to death, according to the majority view, or imprisoned until she repents. According to others, the Quran threatens apostates with punishment in the next world only. The historian W. Heffening states, the traditions, however, contain the element of death penalty. Muslim scholar Shafi'i interprets verse Quran 2 217 as adducing the main evidence for the death penalty in Quran. The historian Wael Halak states the later addition of death penalty reflects a later reality and does not stand in accord with the deeds of the Prophet." He further states that, "...nothing in the law governing apostate and apostasy derives from the letter of the holy text." William Montgomery Watt, in response to a question about Western views of the Islamic law as being cruel, states that, "...in Islamic teaching, such penalties may have been suitable for the age in which Muhammad lived." However, as societies have since progressed and become more peaceful and ordered, they are not suitable any longer." Some contemporary Islamic jurists from both the Sunni and Shia denominations together with Quran only Muslims have argued or issued fatwas that state that either the changing of religion is not punishable or is only punishable under restricted circumstances. For example, Grand Ayatollah Hussein Ali Mantazari argues that no Quranic verse prescribes an earthly penalty for apostasy and adds that it is not improbable that the punishment was prescribed by Muhammad at early Islam due to political conspiracies against Islam and Muslims and not only because of changing the belief or expressing it. Mantazari defines different types of apostasy. He does not hold that a reversion of belief because of investigation and research is punishable by death but prescribes capital punishment for a desertion of Islam out of malice and enmity towards the Muslim. According to Yohannan Friedman, an Israeli Islamic studies scholar, a Muslim may stress tolerant elements of Islam by for instance adopting the broadest interpretation of Quran 2-256. No compulsion is there in religion or the humanist approach attributed to Ibrahim al-Naqai, without necessarily denying the existence of other ideas in the medieval Islamic tradition but rather discussing them in their historical context by for example arguing that, "...civilizations comparable with the Islamic one, such as the Sassanids and the Byzantines, also punished apostasy with death." Similarly neither Judaism nor Christianity treated apostasy and apostates with any particular kindness. Friedman continues, The real predicament facing modern Muslims with liberal convictions is not the existence of stern laws against apostasy in medieval Muslim books of law, but rather the fact that accusations of apostasy and demands to punish it are heard time and again from radical elements in the contemporary Islamic world. <laughs> Human rights conventions Some widely held interpretations of Islam are inconsistent with human rights conventions that recognize the right to change religion. In particular Article 18 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights states 
Everyone has the right to freedom of thought, conscience and religion, this right includes freedom to change his religion or belief, and freedom, either alone or in community with others and in public or private, to manifest his religion or belief in teaching, practice, worship and observance. To implement this, Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights states, No one shall be subject to coercion which would impair his freedom to have or to adopt a religion of his choice. The right for Muslims to change their religion is not afforded by the Iranian Sharia law, which specifically forbids it. In 1981, the Iranian representative to the United Nations, said Rajay Khorasani, articulated the position of his country regarding the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, by saying that the UDHR was, "...a secular understanding of the Judeo-Christian tradition," which could not be implemented by Muslims without trespassing the Islamic law. As a matter of law, on the basis of its obligations as a state party to the ICCPR, Iran is obliged to uphold the right of individuals to practice the religion of their choice and to change religions, including converting from Islam. The prosecution of converts from Islam on the basis of religious edicts that identify apostasy as an offense punishable by death is clearly at variance with this obligation. Muslim-majority countries such as Sudan and Saudi Arabia, have the death penalty for apostasy from Islam. These countries have criticized the Universal Declaration of Human Rights for its perceived failure to take into account the cultural and religious context of non-Western countries. In 1990, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation published a separate Cairo Declaration on Human Rights in Islam compliant with Sharia. Although granting many of the rights in the UN Declaration, it does not grant Muslims the right to convert to other religions, and restricts freedom of speech to those expressions of it that are not in contravention of the Islamic law. Abul Allah Madudi, the founder of Jamaat-e-Islami, wrote a book called Human Rights in Islam, in which he argues that respect for human rights has always been enshrined in Sharia law indeed that the roots of these rights are to be found in Islamic doctrine and criticizes Western notions that there is an inherent contradiction between the two. Western scholars have, for the most part, rejected Madudi's analysis. Topic. Violence. The September 11 attacks on the United States, and various other acts of Islamic terrorism over the 21st century, have resulted in many non-Muslims' indictment of Islam as a violent religion. In particular, the Quran's teachings on matters of war and peace have become topics of heated discussion in recent years. On the one hand, some critics claim that certain verses of the Quran sanction military action against unbelievers as a whole both during the lifetime of Muhammad and after. The Quran says, Fight in the name of your religion with those who fight against you. On the other hand, most Muslim scholars, including Ahmadiyya, argue that such verses of the Quran are interpreted out of context, and argue that when the verses are read in context, it clearly appears that the Quran prohibits aggression and allows fighting only in self defense. Orientalist David Margoliath described the Battle of Khaybar as the stage at which Islam became a menace to the whole world. According to Margoliath, earlier attacks on the Meccans and the Jewish tribes of Medina e.g., the invasion of Banu Qurayza could be at least plausibly be ascribed to wrongs done to Muhammad or the Islamic community. Margoliath argues that the Jews of Kabar had done nothing to harm Muhammad or his followers, and ascribes the attack to a desire for plunder. He describes the reason given by Muhammad for the attack as, "...its inhabitants were not Muslims." Italics in the source. He wrote that this became an excuse for unfettered conquest. Jihad, an Islamic term, is a religious duty of Muslims. In Arabic, the word jihad translates as a noun meaning struggle. Jihad appears 41 times in the Quran and frequently in the idiomatic expression striving for the sake of God, all jihad fi sabil Allah. Jihad is an important religious duty for Muslims. A minority among the Sunni scholars sometimes refer to this duty as the sixth pillar of Islam, though it occupies no such official status. In Twelver Shia Islam, however, jihad is one of the ten practices of the religion. The Quran calls repeatedly for jihad, or holy war, against unbelievers, including, at times, Jews and Christians. Middle East historian Bernard Lewis argues that the overwhelming majority of classical theologians, jurists, and traditionalists specialists in the hadith understood the obligation of jihad in a military sense. 
Furthermore, Lewis maintains that for most of the recorded history of Islam, from the lifetime of Muhammad onward, the word jihad was used in a primarily military sense. Andrew Bostom states that a number of jihads have targeted Christians, Hindus, and Jews. The Quran, 812. Remember, when your Lord inspired to the angels, I am with you, so strengthen those who have believed. I will cast terror into the hearts of those who disbelieved, so strike them upon the necks and strike from them every fingertip. And Quran, 830. And remember, O Muhammad, when those who disbelieved plotted against you to restrain you or kill you or evict you from Makkah. But they plan, and Allah plans. And Allah is the best of planners. And the Quran, 838. Say to those who have disbelieved that, if they cease, what has previously occurred will be forgiven for them. But if they return to hostility, then the precedent of the former rebellious peoples has already taken place. Quote, the phrase that they have been commanded to terrorize the disbelievers has been cited in motivation of jihadi terror. One jihadi cleric has said, Another aim and objective of jihad is to drive terror in the hearts of the infidels. To terrorize them. Did you know that we were commanded in the Quran with terrorism? Allah said, and prepare for them to the best of your ability with power, and with horses of war. To drive terror in the hearts of my enemies, Allah's enemies, and your enemies. And other enemies which you don't know, only Allah knows them. So we were commanded to drive terror into the hearts of the infidels, to prepare for them with the best of our abilities with power. Then the Prophet said, Nay, the power is your ability to shoot. The power which you are commanded with here, is your ability to shoot. Another aim and objective of jihad is to kill the infidels, to lessen the population of the infidels. It is not right for a prophet to have captives until he makes the earth warm with blood. So, you should always seek to lessen the population of the infidels. David Cook, author of Understanding Jihad, said, In reading Muslim literature, both contemporary and classical, one can see that the evidence for the primacy of spiritual jihad is negligible. Today it is certain that no Muslim, writing in a non-Western language such as Arabic, Persian, Urdu, would ever make claims that jihad is primarily non-violent or has been superseded by the spiritual jihad. Such claims are made solely by Western scholars, primarily those who study Sufism and or work in interfaith dialogue, and by Muslim apologists who are trying to present Islam in the most innocuous manner possible." Cook argued that, "...presentations along these lines are ideological in tone and should be discounted for their bias and deliberate ignorance of the subject." and that it is no longer acceptable for Western scholars or Muslim apologists writing in non-Muslim languages to make flat, unsupported statements concerning the prevalence, either from a historical point of view or within contemporary Islam, of the spiritual jihad. Magdi Alam, an outspoken Egyptian-born Italian journalist, has described Islam as intrinsically violent and characterized by hate and intolerance. Dennis Prager, columnist and author, in responding to a movement that contends that Islam is a religion of peace, wrote, Now, Islam has never been a religion of peace. It began as a warlike religion and throughout its history, whenever possible, made war on non-Muslims, from the polytheists of North Africa to the Hindus of India, about 60 to 80 million of whom Muslims killed during their thousand-year rule there. John R. Newman, a scholar on religion, describes Islam as a perfect anti-religion and the antithesis of Buddhism. Topic: <laughs> Homosexuals. Critics such as lesbian activist Ershad Manji, former Muslims Asan Jamie, and the former Dutch politician Ayan Hersi Ali have criticized Islam's attitudes towards homosexuals. Most international human rights organizations, such as Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, condemn Islamic laws that make homosexual relations between consenting adults a crime. Since 1994 the United Nations Human Rights Committee has also ruled that such laws violated the right to privacy guaranteed in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. In May 2008, the sexual rights lobby group Lambda Istanbul based in Istanbul, Turkey was banned by court order for violating a constitutional provision on the protection of the family and an article banning bodies with objectives that violate law and morality. 
This decision was then taken to the Court of Cassation and the ban lifted. In ten Muslim majority countries, homosexual acts may be punishable by death, though in some the punishment has never been carried out. The ex Muslim Ibn Warak has noted that the Quran's condemnation of homosexuality has frequently been ignored in practice, and that Muslim majority countries were much more tolerant of homosexuality than Christian ones until fairly recently. Short term and limited marriages Short-term marriage Nika al-Mut'ah Arabic, Anka al-M literally pleasure marriage is a fixed term or short-term contractual marriage in Shia Islam. The duration of this type of marriage is fixed at its inception and is then automatically dissolved upon completion of its term. For this reason, Nika Mut'ah has been widely criticized as the religious cover and legalization of prostitution. The Christian missionary Thomas Patrick Hughes criticized Mutah as allowing the continuation of one of the abominable practices of ancient Arabia. Shia and Sunnis agree that Mutah was legal in early times, but Sunnis consider that it was abrogated. Ibn Kathir writes that, T here's no doubt that in the outset of Islam, Mutah was allowed under the Sharia. Currently, however, Mutah is one of the distinctive features of Jafari jurisprudence. No other school of Islamic jurisprudence allows it. According to Imam Jafar as Sadiq, one of the matters about which I shall never keep precautionary silence is the matter of muta. Alama Tabatabai defends the Shia view in Tafsir al Mizan, arguing that there are Matawatir or nearly Matawatir traditions narrated from the Shia Imams that muta is permitted. For example, it has been narrated from Muhammad al Bakir and Jafar al Sadiq that they said, Regarding the above verse, and there is no blame on you about what you mutually agree after what is appointed. It means that he increases her dowry or she increases his fixed period. Sunnis believe that Muhammad later abolished this type of marriage at several different large events, the most accepted being at Kabar in 7 AH 629 CE Bukhari 059. 527 and at the victory of Mecca in 8 AH 630 CE. Most Sunnis believe that Umar later was merely enforcing a prohibition that was established during Muhammad's time. Shia contest the criticism that Nika Mutah is a cover for prostitution, and argue that the unique legal nature of temporary marriage distinguishes Mutah ideologically from prostitution. Topic. Contractually limited marriage Nika misire Arabic, almsire is a type of nika marriage in Sunni Islam only carried out through the normal contractual procedure, with the provision that the husband and wife give up several rights by their own free will, such as living together, equal division of nights between wives in cases of polygamy, the wife's rights to housing, and maintenance money nafika, and the husband's right of homekeeping and access. Essentially the couple continue to live separately from each other, as before their contract, and see each other to fulfill their needs in a legally permissible halal manner when they please. Misire has been suggested by some Western authors to be a comparable marriage with Nika Mutah and that they find it for the sole purpose of sexual gratification in a licit manner. According to Florian Pohl, assistant professor of religion at Oxford College, misire marriage is controversial issue in the Muslim world, as many see it as practice that encourages marriages for purely sexual purposes, or that it is used as a cover for a form of prostitution. Professor Yusuf al karadawa observes that he does not promote this type of marriage, although he has to recognize that it is legal, since it fulfills all the requirements of the usual marriage contract. He states his preference that the clause of renunciation be not included within the marriage contract, but be the subject of a simple verbal agreement between the parties. Islamic scholars like Ibn Uthaymin or al-Albani claim, for their part, that misire marriage may be legal, but not moral. They agree that the wife can at any time, reclaim the rights which she gave up at the time of contract. But, they are opposed to this type of marriage on the grounds that it contradicts the spirit of the Islamic law of marriage and that it has perverse effects on the woman, the family and the community in general. For al-Albani, misire marriage may even be considered as illicit, because it runs counter to the objectives and the spirit of marriage in Islam, as described in the Quran. And among his signs is this, that he created for you mates from among yourselves, that ye may dwell in tranquility with them, and he has put love and mercy between your hearts. Al-Albani also underlines the social problems which result from the misire marriage, particularly in the event that children are born from this union. 
The children raised by their mother in a home from which the father is always absent, without reason, may suffer difficulties. The situation becomes even worse if the wife is abandoned or repudiated by her husband, Misire, with no means of subsistence, as usually happens. Ibn Uthaymin recognized the legality of Misire marriage under Sharia, but came to oppose it due to what he considered to be its harmful effects. Women in Islam Domestic violence The relationship between Islam and domestic violence is heavily disputed. Even among Muslims, the uses and interpretations of Sharia, the moral code and religious law of Islam, lack consensus. One notable verse in the topic is 434, which states, As to those women from whom you fear disobedience, first admonish them, then refuse to share your bed with them, and then, if necessary, beat them, and if thereupon they pay you heed, do not seek to harm them. Nearly all scholars agree that it allows a husband to hit his wife, but in a way that does not cause physical pain, although others claim it only supports separating from one's wife. Due to the way domestic violence is handled in some modern-day Muslim states, a few organizations have suggested ways to modify Sharia-inspired laws to improve women's rights in Islamic nations, including women's rights in domestic abuse cases. Topic: <laughs> Personal status laws and child marriage. Sharia is the basis for personal status laws in most Islamic majority nations. These personal status laws determine rights of women in matters of marriage, divorce and child custody. A 2011 UNICEF report concludes that Sharia law provisions are discriminatory against women from a human rights perspective. In legal proceedings under Sharia law, a woman's testimony is worth half of a man's before a court, except for Iran, Lebanon and Bahrain which allow child marriages. The civil code in Islamic majority countries do not allow child marriage of girls. However, with Sharia personal status laws, Sharia courts in all these nations have the power to override the civil code. The religious courts permit girls less than 18 years old to marry. As of 2011, child marriages are common in a few Middle Eastern countries, accounting for one in six all marriages in Egypt and one in three marriages in Yemen. However, the average age at marriage in most Middle Eastern countries is steadily rising and is generally in the low to mid-twenties for women. Rape is considered a crime in all countries, but Sharia courts in Bahrain, Iraq, Jordan, Libya, Morocco, Syria and Tunisia in some cases allow a rapist to escape punishment by marrying his victim, while in other cases the victim who complains is often prosecuted with the crime of zina adultery. <laughs> <laughs> Women's right to property and consent Sharia grants women the right to inherit property from other family members, and these rights are detailed in the Quran. A woman's inheritance is unequal and less than a man's, and dependent on many factors. Quran 4:12, for instance, a daughter's inheritance is usually half that of her brother's. Quran 4:11, Islamic law grants Muslim women many legal rights, such as the right to own property received as mar, Brita price, at her marriage, that Western legal systems did not grant to women, according to Jamal Badawi. However, Islamic law does not grant non-Muslim women the same legal rights. Sharia recognizes the basic inequality between master and women slave, between free women and slave women, between believers and non-believers, as well as their unequal rights. Sharia authorized the institution of slavery, using the words abad slave and the phrase ma malakat amanukam, that which your right hand owns, to refer to women slaves, seized as captives of war. Under Islamic law, Muslim men could have sexual relations with female captives and slaves without her consent. Slave women under Sharia did not have a right to own property, right to free movement, or right to consent. Sharia, in Islam's history, provided religious foundation for enslaving non Muslim women and men, as well as encouraged slaves' manumission. However, manumission required that the non Muslim slave first convert to Islam. Non-Muslim slave women who bore children to their Muslim masters became legally free upon her master's death, and her children were presumed to be Muslims as their father. In Africa, and elsewhere, starting with the 20th century, Western legal systems evolved to expand women's rights, but women's rights under Islamic law have remained tied to Quran, hadiths and their faithful interpretation as sharia by Islamic jurists. Topic. Criticism of Muslim immigrants and immigration 
The immigration of Muslims to Europe has increased in recent decades and conservative Muslim social attitudes on modern issues have caused controversy in Europe and other parts of the world. Scholars argue about how much these attitudes are a result of culture rather than Islamic beliefs, while some critics consider Islam to be incompatible with secular Western society. Some also believe that Islam positively commands its adherents to impose its religious law on all peoples, believers and unbelievers alike, whenever possible and by any means necessary. Their criticism has been partly influenced by a stance against multiculturalism advocated by recent philosophers, closely linked to the heritage of new philosophers. Statements by proponents like Pascal Bruckner describe multiculturalism as an invention of an enlightened Elite who deny the benefits of democratic rights to non-Westerners by chaining them to their roots. They also state that multiculturalism allows a degree of religious freedom that exceeds what is needed for personal religious freedom and is conducive to the creation of organizations aimed at undermining European secular or Christian values. Topic. Comparison with communism and fascist ideologies In 2004, speaking to the Acton Institute on the problems of secular democracy, Cardinal George Pell drew a parallel between Islam and communism. Islam may provide in the 21st century, the attraction that communism provided in the 20th, both for those that are alienated and embittered on the one hand and for those who seek order or justice on the other. Pell also agrees in another speech that its capacity for far-reaching renovation is severely limited. An Australian Islamist spokesman, Kieser Trad, responded to the criticism, "...communism is a godless system, a system that in fact persecutes faith." Geert Wilders, a controversial Dutch member of parliament and leader of the Party for Freedom, has also compared Islam to fascism and communism. Islamism writers such as Stephen Suleiman Schwartz and Christopher Hitchens, find some elements of Islamism fascistic. Melise Ruthven, a Scottish writer and historian who writes on religion and Islamic affairs, opposes redefining Islamism as Islamofascism, but also finds the resemblances between the two ideologies compelling. French philosopher Alexander Del Valle compared Islamism with fascism and communism in his Red Green Brown Alliance theory. Raymond Leo Burke, a cardinal deacon of the Catholic Church, has stated that Islam is not a religion but a totalitarian political system with religious elements which is dedicated to the conquest of the whole world. Topic. Responses to criticism John Esposito has written a number of introductory texts on Islam and the Islamic world. He has addressed issues including the rise of militant Islam, the veiling of women, and democracy. Esposito emphatically argues against what he calls the pan-Islamic myth. He thinks that too often coverage of Islam and the Muslim world assumes the existence of a monolithic Islam in which all Muslims are the same. To him, such a view is naive and unjustifiably obscures important divisions and differences in the Muslim world. William Montgomery Watt, in his book Muhammad, Prophet and Statesman, addresses Muhammad's alleged moral failings. Watt argues on a basis of moral relativism that Muhammad should be judged by the standards of his own time and country rather than by those of the most enlightened opinion in the West today. Karen Armstrong, tracing what she believes to be the West's long history of hostility toward Islam, finds in Muhammad's teachings a theology of peace and tolerance. Armstrong holds that the holy war urged by the Quran alludes to each Muslim's duty to fight for a just, decent society. Edward Said, in his essay Islam Through Western Eyes, stated that the general basis of Orientalist thought forms a study structure in which Islam is placed in an inferior position as an object of study. He claims the existence of a very considerable bias in Orientalist writings as a consequence of the scholar's cultural makeup. He claims Islam has been looked at with a particular hostility and fear due to many obvious religious, psychological and political reasons, all deriving from a sense that so far as the West is concerned, Islam represents not only a formidable competitor but also a late-coming challenge to Christianity. Kathy Young of Reason magazine claims that Criticism of the religion is enmeshed with cultural and ethnic hostility, often painting the Muslim world as monolithic, while stating that the terms Islamophobia and anti-Muslim bigotry 
are often used in response to legitimate criticism of fundamentalist Islam and problems within Muslim culture, she claimed. The real thing does exist, and it frequently takes the cover of anti-jihadism. See also Notes References Ali, Muhammad Muhammad the Prophet Ahmadiyya Anjuman Ishad Islam. ISBN 978-0913321072. Cohen, Mark R. Under Crescent and Cross. Princeton University Press, Reissue Edition. ISBN 978-0691010823. Lachman, Zachary Contending Visions of the Middle East, The History and Politics of Orientalism. Cambridge University Press. ISBN 978-0521629379. Rippon, Andrew Muslims, Their Religious Beliefs and Practices 2nd ed. Routledge. ISBN 978-0415217811. Westerland, David Ahmed Didit's Theology of Religion, Apologetics Through Polemics. Journal of Religion in Africa. 33 263. doi, 10.1163, Further reading Islam and Dimitude, Where Civilizations Collide by Bat Yeor Decline of Eastern Christianity, From Jihad to Dimitude by Bat Yeor The Al-Qaeda Connection, International Terrorism, Organized Crime, and the Coming Apocalypse by Paul L. Williams Prometheus Books, ISBN 1591023491 2005. The Amazing Quran by Gary Miller an Autumn of War, What America Learned from September 11 and the War on Terrorism by Victor Davis Hanson Anchor Books, 2002. ISBN 1400031133 A collection of essays, mostly from National Review, covering events occurring between September 11, 2001 and January 2002 Arabs and Israel, Conflict or Conciliation, by Sheikh Ahmed Hussein Didit Slavery in Islam, BBC, September 7, 2009 Jihad, The Trail of Political Islam by Giles Keppel The War for Muslim Minds by Giles Keppel J. Tolan, Saracens, Islam in the Medieval European Imagination 2002. Esposito, John L. 1995. The Islamic Threat, Myth or Reality. Oxford University Press. ISBN 0195102983. Halliday, Fred. 2003. Islam and the Myth of Confrontation: Religion and Politics of the Middle East. New York, I.B. Tories. ISBN 1860648681. Hamdi, Ahmed. 2003. Unholy War: Terror in the Name of Islam. New York, Oxford University Press. ISBN 0195168860. Geisler, Norman L. 2002. Answering Islam, The Crescent in Light of the Cross. Baker Books. ISBN 0801064309. Ibn Warak, Why I Am Not a Muslim 1995. Leaving Islam, Apostates Speak Out. The Institute for the Study of Civil Society Report, The West, Islam and Islamism. Zwemer Islam, A Challenge to Faith New York, 1907 Shoja-e-Din Shafa, Rebirth 1995, Persian title Twildi Dijer Shoja-e-Din Shafa, After 1400 Years 2000, Persian title, Peas as 1400 Sal Topic. External links Media related to criticism of Islam at Wikimedia Commons